So I talked about the competitive advantage. A competitive advantage is an excellence that you have that exceeds the competitors around you. You do this thing better than anyone else. Whatever your particular feeling is about Apple, the one thing that you cannot deny is the quality of the products that they have, which is also a straitjacket for them as well. So for any of you who can remember this far back, there aren't many of you, but when Apple Maps came out, um, it was a dog, okay? It, it was pretty bad, all right? Um, Apple, let's see, it was, what else was there going on at the time? I forgot, but yeah, Apple Maps was really bad. Now, Google Maps went through the exact same thing. Google Maps, when, when programs go from beta testing, they start with an alpha test and then a beta test is when they're generally used by the public. Well, in a beta test, Google Maps would crash every once in a while, and, you know, and I mean, they would be crashing on millions of particular mobile um, phones all over. That information is phoned home, it's sent up, the algorithms run through, and basically what happens is by a process of elimination, it gets rid of the bugs, all right? So anyone who's ever used Google, hey, you live with it. That's just the price of success, all right? But the individuals who used Apple expected more. You know, Apple users don't expect beta site. They want perfection from day one. And as I said, it's a blessing and it's a curse. And so product quality, that particular excellence that you have, it, where you exceed the customers is something that must be maintained. Otherwise, once it's lost, you just can't get it back many times, all right? So, you know, they show Amazon here for distribution networks. I would argue Walmart is up there at the same time. Um, quite simply, Walmart has the best distri distribution network in the world. Um, Walmart in the 90s decided that they were going within 10 years to not have a dry shipment. What a dry shipment means is, is that there would never be a single truck Walmart truck in the United States that would be empty. In other words, they would coordinate everything that they had so that every Walmart truck left with goods going from one location to another. They did it in three. That's the kind of superiority that Walmart has in its distribution networks. They can add a few tellers every once in a while, but hey, that's not what their excellence is in. And then, of course, innovation and access to new technology is Tesla. Um, well, we got a case coming up for Tesla, so I don't want to talk about its particular geniuses. But I will say one of the things that they have done is, is that they have secured a significant distribution chain that's vital to them. And without it, you, you, they don't have success. And so what is the thing that you can do that you do better than anyone else? That's the question. I got a question. Where does it's a well? I'll go ahead. Where is Nike's factories? It's a trick question. I'm I'm sorry. Nike has no factories. Okay. Nike has one place in Corvallis, Oregon. I've actually been there. Nike doesn't is not in the business of building shoes. Nike is about shoe design and apparel design and nothing else, all right? The other second part of this discussion about competitive advantage, and you'll be talking about this in your MBAs is, is that as a corporation, you focus on your competitive advantage and nothing else, all right? Everything else you buy. So in the last two decades, we have seen libraries and universities taken over by Barnes and Noble. We have seen commissaries being taken over by Cisco. Uh, we have been seeing landscaping taken over by third parties because we're in the business to educate students and not provide meals. However, 
the mission of Appalachian State says that our library is a vital asset, that it is important for us to own it and that we do. Not only that, but the commissary that we have, the food that you eat comes from farmers all across the 12 county area here. And so, yes, it is a strategic asset for us, okay? So what I'm going for this thing with Nike is to basically state that focusing on your competitive advantage is the purpose and your goal, all right? And, and what you should be doing. So Nike has this interesting thing. They will actually go out there, they will pull factories, they'll find out who will make their shoes and then they'll, they'll make the shoes. Then they'll do one more thing they will allow the factories to run up to 10% more of those shoes and sell them to Walmart as long as they don't put the Nike swoosh brand on. All right. So it's very possible that the, uh, the shoes you get in Shoe Town or Walmart, they're possibly Nike designs. Okay. So, but they don't have the swoosh. So that's how Nike makes its money. All right. It focuses on apparel and shoe design, nothing else. Interestingly enough, um, Armour was under Armour went the entire different opposite direction. They focused on apparel and then have gone into shoe design, but it's basically the same market. Okay. So, so I was talking about marketing strategy decisions. And some of the things an organization's strategy describes how the firm will fulfill the needs and wants of their customers. That's one of the things when you create a strategy is it must first and foremost always be designed for the consumers. And this is the difference of opinion I have with OC's book about the marketing or channels. And I'll talk about that when it comes up, all right? This also includes maintaining relationships with other stakeholders and realize is that marketing programs consist of two elements. It's actually three, okay? It's the target market. Who are we focusing? Who is the core individual who our marketing efforts are going to go through? And when we're focused on that particular market, how do we take and create this mix, this lever of things in order to maximize a consumer's benefits? There's actually three decisions, segmentation, targeting, positioning. So let's talk about segmentation. So, Somebody give me the uses of a bicycle. Transportation. Transportation. All right, what else? Exercise. Exercise. All right, what else? Recreation. Recreation, sure. What else? How about kids? Okay. What else? Why else would you ride a bike? Business. Business, yeah. Maybe you maybe you're a delivery person. Yeah, there you go. Business, I like it. Okay. What else? You're gonna fight competition. Pardon me? Competition. Competition. Now we're waiting for somebody to say competition. Very good. Anything else while we're talking? Leisure. Leisure, which yeah, recreation you can put in there, but got it. So let's just go with these six things. All right. Now we're talking about something as ubiquitous as a bicycle. And yet each one of these, if we consider it, has a different individual that would desire a bike for any one of those different reasons. And the amazing thing about it, if you think about it, is all I have to do is craft the message and that same bicycle could be sold in six different ways. And so this is the process of segmentation. Segmentation is the ability of looking at the entire market in unique same-like segments. And we'll talk much more about segmentation, but I wanted it to get you in your mind now, okay? So what we could do with this little exercise here, we could take this transportation and this exercise and the recreation 
and maybe the business. And what we can do is we can define which one of these markets we want to target. And this is the definition of a target market, all right? It is the individual market based upon the segmentation that we decide based upon our limited resources, we can maximize our benefits, all right? And the last thing that we do is based upon the benefits that our bikes have, is we create a position strategy. We create a place in the consumer's mind that is unique and separate from our competition. That can be through our brand identity. That can be through the product or qualities of our, our product. It could be that we're cheaper. It could be that we have it closer. We could be using possession utility in essence being as a ride share. All of those are ways that we can create a unique product benefit. And those are the ways that we create ultimately all of those mixed together. And this is the concept of segmentation and targeting. We divide the marketplace into smaller homogeneous segments. In other words, um, let's see. The concept of segments is Think of it this way, when you define a word, a word or a definition has to be what we call mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, all right? So when we define a segment, it has to be everything that it is and nothing that it isn't. And those particular characteristics are not shared between the segments, all right? So when we're talking about market segmentation, we want to come up with definitions that are parsimonious. It almost is that exact as we can get it, all right? But parsimoniousness is a very big key. We want to be able to define that segment by their needs and their wants and their characteristics. We want to be able to put a visual image of who that is. Then what we want to do, the decision process in target marketing is deciding which one of those particular markets based upon our abilities we wish to go after. It doesn't have to be one. It can be multiple markets. It can be the mass market. Once again, it can be whatever that particular item appeals to. So there are items that require mass appeal, let's just say Coke, and that in essence appeals to all markets. And so it needs much more mass marketing than other niche products might, such as outdoor equipment. But it's the determining of those markets ultimately that defines our strategies. And so this is segmentation, targeting, positioning, and then the four levers of the four, four P's in order to make that possible. So, products fulfilled needs and the wants of their customers. We'll talk about these in much greater detail. This all is outlined in chapter six. Prices lead to revenues and profits. Of the four Ps, it is the easiest to change, which makes it the most difficult. Does anyone want to guess which of the four Ps is the most difficult to change? Product. Pardon? Product. No. Price? Nope. Place. Thank you. Yes, place. Of all of the four Ps, place is the most difficult. It requires months of contractual work. It requires you to have interpersonal relationships between independent organizations. And don't write down supply chain. I don't know why OC put it there. Put dis distribution, okay? 
because I don't care about the raw materials or the finished products or the ultimate delivery I do, but there's only one word in here that has to do with distribution that matches what happens in marketing channels and it's the customer, All right? And that is the difference between channels of distribution and supply chain. The focus always in marketing is on the consumer. We don't believe it's a supply chain. We believe it's a demand chain, all right? The consumer demand drives all the decisions in supply chain. Dr. Dave is gonna get mad at me. And finally, promotion is also, is really, it's no longer called advertising. Um, it's called Integrated Marketing Communications, IMC. Because IMC basically states what it is, integrated marketing communications. It's the coordination of all of the promotion activities all together. Because you want a unified, focused, consumer-focused message. And so these are the four Ps, products, build the needs, whether they're tangible or intangible. Price is what leads to our being able to make money. Channels of distribution is how we deliver our goods based upon our consumer desires. And promotion is how we go about bringing our message to the consumer, hopefully to fulfill a need or desire that they have. So I talked about branding and positioning out of getting caught ahead of myself. Positioning is the mental image or position of the product relative to the competing offerings. And this is why we study our competitors. Because if we don't know where our competitors are, we don't know where we are. If I say Walmart and I say Target, you have two completely different mental images. And that's good. That's the way it is. If I were to say Dollar General, you would have a unique message. Um, we had the, the guy that was a head of distribution uh, speak last year in one of my classes. And Dollar General is committed to opening a thousand stores a year. And they have been opening a thousand stores a year since 2009. Yes, they have 38,000 stores now. Can you believe it, all right? And they have a really unique position relative to Walmart and all the other locations. I want you to think about Dollar General. Dollar Generals are on the way out of town, aren't they? Okay, so if you look at the Dollar General, Going towards Wilkesboro, it's on the other side. It's going out of town. If you look at the one going towards Tennessee, it's on the right-hand side going out of town. That's the way they do it, okay? Um, it's kind of unique also that they put themselves in unique locations between smaller towns as small as 1,500 people. I was talking to him. My wife had just mentioned once that, yeah, but they need green things in there and sure enough two months later you started seeing broccoli in there and all sorts of things in the freezers the freezers have built built up um let me ask you this anybody who's been in there where are the breakfast things in the dollar general or am i the only one who goes like rising walk in yes exactly where are they in walmart they're over there in the back. And Walmart does that on purpose because Walmart wants you to walk by all of the things that are on sale first. Dollar General does it. Dollar General puts it right out in front. If they had organic milk, my wife would never go anywhere else. Okay. Yeah. So this is product positioning. Dollar General is different from Walmart, is different from Target. And that differences are what create value because the goal is to differentiate. Be different from your be different from your competitors 
be able to stand out. So the last part we'll talk about is we'll talk about implementation and control. We kind of talk about the fifth P being people. I've also heard the sixth P being politics, but how we go about implementing the strategy and how it's executed and what we do in order to fulfill our goals. And this is ultimately also where objectives come in because objectives, as I stated, are time-based, they're quantitative in nature so that you can determine success or lack thereof. And marketing is all about people. It, it really is. Um, it's, it's the product, all of those things in an era of commoditization, it's the individuals in your organizations. They're the ones that help you achieve success or failure. Which is another reason why leadership classes are going big now. And so implementation, <laughs> this is chapter nine. Um, this is a little talking about what are the 10 best companies to work for. Interestingly enough, Hilton is number one, which my wife would tell you, of course, she's a diamond member. Um, but if, if there is no business that is more people oriented than lodging, I don't know what is. By the way, anybody want to know how many different Hilton hotel types there are? One. Pardon? One. 12. That's a good guess. All right. But think about it. How many ways can you go to sleep? All right. <laughs> They came up with 12, all right? They have two different types of residence inns, okay? They go all the way from sleep all the way to, oh, I forgot what's the name of it. Um, anyway, you get it, okay? But that's its uniqueness, all right? So these are the best, just in case you're wanting. This is 2020, I think, 2021. And then the last thing I'm just going to basically touch on is the thought that we're no longer in the concept of what's known as transactional marketing. Transactional marketing, it, the way that Hill described it um, in 1980 was if you were to go get gas at a gas station, paid cash, and never came back, that's what transaction marketing means. But we're in a different era now. We're in an era where relationships mean more than ever. We'll talk about Morgan and Hunt's theories of trust and commitment and how they work with relationship marketing later. But one of the more important things for us to do is to evaluate and determine what are our best long-term relationships that we can have with our consumers. Now, the flip side also has been discussed quite about uh, quite a bit, and that's the old question of should we fire customers? And I've heard that as well. And the answer is, well, not every customer is great. And there's an old saying, the customer may not always be right, but the customer is always your customer. And so we always have what's known as a leaky bucket. In other words, we have a series of customers out there that are committed to our particular way but we always need to grow our customer base so that they'll return again and again if they possibly can. Customer relationships are vital. And as I talked about in the 70s, we moved from this selling orientation to relationship orientation. And the truth is, is that relationships have mattered. It's not necessarily what I would consider an invention, but more of a discovery. It's a paradigm shift in the way we think, okay? All right, so we are going to take a break, but the last thing I wanna just basically say here, this, the biggest challenge that marketing faces is change. Our customers are changing, the technology is changing. The important thing about marketing strategy though, is it's inherently people dri driven. And as long as we focus on the consumer, 
identify their needs and wants, the same things that I'm talking about 10 years ago are the things that I can talk about now. All right. I just updated for current events. Marketers have to be able to shift to meet the competition and the markets as they change. Just remember this customer expectations have always been high, but we always, if we orient ourselves to our consumers, we've got the best shot of making it work. All right, let's take a break. I need to get a cup of coffee. All right, just in case, I don't know if you ever noticed this about um, PowerPoint. If, if you don't change PowerPoint, it takes over your entire machine. If you go to set up slideshow, browse by individual, and then do an F5 now, it goes in the window instead of being all encompassing and eating up your screen. So you learned something today. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Let us continue. And so the marketing program is, as I said before, the four levers after we do all of the strategy, all the targeting and all the positioning, these are the active things that marketing managers have to be able to ultimately create a unique product or benefit, whatever you wanna say, the sum of benefits that consumers desire. Um, the four Ps, the first time they ever mentioned this was in 1945 at the AMA convention. Jerome McCarthy, who wrote one of the marketing management books that is still um, to this day being used, um, called it marketing management in 1960 and talked about the four Ps. We still go with the four Ps, but of course, as time has changed, our definitions of what the four Ps mean have broadened as well, but it's still the four Ps. And so the four Ps are price, promotion, product, and place. And of course, the one that we're going to talk about is in that strategic mix, we're going to be talking about product first, all right? So remember this is that the product receives the most emphasis because it is the unique offering that hopefully fulfills and satisfies the consumer's needs and wants, but realize that price and promotion and place add intangible values to those particular items and they increase the value as well. And so remember this is that a product can be tangible, physical, a service, or it can be symbolic in nature, an experience, one that we will be able to be satisfied with and be happy with for years to come. So let's talk about products and we'll talk about strategies. The first one to recognize is what is a product line? Okay, so a product line are all those closely related products that are similar or generic in fashion that make up one particular line. Laundry detergent is a classic one. 
Laundry detergent, if you think about it, has certain characteristics and expectations that we have. Those have been built around our uses over years. And that everything within that particular product line has to meet or exceed whatever those consumers are wanting. Now, one of the unique things about, I'll go on with dishwashing just for a bit. One of the unique things about dishwashing, or excuse me, laundry detergent was laundry detergent always used to be solid. It was powder, all right? The consumer perception of a liquid detergent was always about washing dishes. Um, in the 60s and the 70s, they used something called phosphates in our laundry detergent to be able to clean things. So what is a phosphate? It's phosphorus, all right? So if you know anything about chemistry, phosphorus is a heating element. And what the phosphorus would do is help heat the clothes, whether the water was warm or not. And that became or how soap works is as an emulsifier. It breaks down the composition of the dirt. Well, somebody in the 60s came up with the brilliant assumption that dumping those phosphates in our water system may not be a good idea. So we saw a fundamental change in the way that consumers decided that they were going to use detergents. And during this time, Procter & Gamble came up with an idea for liquid laundry detergent, and it was called GAIN. And so the difficulty was, how do we get consumers to try something new that isn't in our expectation? And so this is what they did. This was 1977. Um, at that time, if you wanted to be able to distribute things door to door, you went to newspaper subscriptions. Newspaper subscriptions at that time went to two thirds of the individuals in the United States, and they sent out 60 million bottles, yay big, of two servings or two uses of game. And the two uses were strategic because people think in threes and not twos, all right? So they looked at two almost as an incompletion. And overnight, the way we consider laundry detergent moving from solids to liquid changed forever. And now everybody's got a liquid detergent. So anyway, now if you look at the product lines, you're going to find both solid and liquid detergents. There are dozens, or do, there's a dozen in the pre and G line. And then each one of those have separate solids or liquids, depending on what you want. A product mix is all of the different things in that particular product line. The total group of all the products that are offered. Procter & Gamble even offers, I don't know why, but they offer car washes. I have no idea why, all right? They just decided that car washing was a good idea and we're going to get in it, and they are. Variety is the different product lines and the assortment is the depth in that particular line. I'll explain this a little bit later. I don't want you to get caught up into this because this is all just basic stuff. We'll talk about it later, all right? Just want you to go past that. It's important for you under, to understand is why do you have so many different items? Well, Procter & Gamble wants to be able to do that in many reasons because they want to diversify risk. If I have a wide range of given items, depending on consumer taste, as consumer taste changes, I will hopefully have a solution for all the consumers within my product line. And that's where the economies of scale also kick in. One of the also things that you have with a product portfolio or a mix is you have product uniformity. Can anybody tell me what a Campbell's soup pan looks like? What's the colors? Red and white. Yeah, doesn't matter. You know what it is. As a matter of fact, 
And this is kind of an important thing about pa uh, package uniformity. Um, there are two ways that consumers choose things. One is what's known as the peripheral route, and the other is known as the central route. What that basically means is that consumers make two ways to make choices, depending on risk and the amount of time required to make it. So if a consumer is buying an automobile or they're buying an expensive televisions, consumers will use the central route. In other words, they will use cognitive thinking in order to come up with their assumptions. The peripheral route is when a good does not require in-depth thinking, or as let's just say it's wasteful if they do, and they take central informational cues such as color and shape. And so, especially in those items that are called fast-moving consumer goods or impulse items, if I'm about to go out and I'm in the candy aisle and I see an orange color, what do I think is in the candy aisle? Reese's. Yeah, that's one of them. Yes. Shape. Anybody ever see a chunky? You don't see chunkies anymore. A chunky is a solid piece of chocolate like this. It's practically a square, a cube. And the chunky is unique in its shape. And that's the other reason why. You create these uniformities so that the consumers understand what those goods are before they ever reach for them. And, and the, that ability to locate them quickly also contributes to the consumer because they don't have to think about the choice, they just reach, okay? Standardization. You can sh uh, share component products between the lines. Now, some people have this as a problem. Alan Mullally, Alan Mullally was one of the most brilliant people um, to ever uh, man Ford. Uh, he became the CEO in 2005, Boeing. He came from Boeing. He was an engineer, interesting people, engineers. He came from Boeing. He was part of the group that created the first digital cockpit. And he was up for the CEO of Boeing and he didn't make it, which may give you a consideration of why Boeing is in the shape that it's in right now. Anyway, he goes to Ford in 2005. And the first thing that he does is he starts eliminating models that Ford has, Jaguar, International, sells them off. He finds out that Ford has 29 different radiators in the 35 different bodies that they sell. How many, how many radiators does Toyota have? One, all right? That's efficiency, okay? So standardization is a value if your organization embraces it. You're able to share component parts between the lines and it creates much greater efficiency. Not only that, but you can also have sales and distribution efficiencies that happen as well. You have favorable lines where the consumers are happy with. You have also graduated parts where brand new to individuals come online and they're more accepted more readily because they already have established products along the way. So this is the reason why you create portfolios like this. Now, they talk about the challenges of service products, whereas I consider the advantages of service products, okay? So this is a list in the next few slides, it's going to talk about these one at a time. Service products have five basic components. I talked about these briefly on Tuesday. And so let's talk about them one at a time. The first is intangibility. Ride sharing, Uber, Lyft, that would be intangible. StubHub. All of those, those are intangibles. Intangibles are difficult to evaluate their quality. Realize they're selling a promise. Service prices are very difficult to set and hard to justify. Anybody ever walk in the lawyer's office? 
Well, not the culture. Really. Yeah, right. <laughs> they say one third of the money is ours, and you keep the rest. Okay, that's how most of most of them work. Anyway, if that's if you're suing somebody. Okay. Now, two hundred dollars is you know is how much it costs to collect in Pasco usually, um, but you don't have a possession of a service. It goes away. And of course, digital is making it more difficult, better and harder than ever to be able to evaluate it because quite simply, you don't know sometimes if someone got a bad deal. And so intangibility is one of the hallmarks of a service. The next is with an intangible, you simultaneously produce and consume at the same time. Usually there will be others present at the same time and others can impact that particular experience. Try walking in the lost province and saying, I wanna go sit down right now. And they'll say, fine, you got about an hour. My one of my best friends is the manager there at uh, Lost Province, and my gosh, they're just exploding right now. I have no idea. Well, the tourists in the house. The quality experience is absolutely critical. One of the most difficult things that we have to manage with right now is the meeting and the exceeding of expectations, and we all have ways that we can express ourselves. One of the truest statements that ever come out is that two thirds of the people who no longer come to your business will leave, will leave and never tell you why. And so that's a difficult. Now, let me say this to all of you. I always give this speech to my marketing uh, students. Tell them what they did wrong. Now don't rhymes with Mitch, okay? You know, don't do that because realize they're people and they're all trying to do their best as well, especially under these times. But if you can explain to them why something went wrong, you can turn a service failure into a service success. So I was in Milwaukee, oh gosh, it was 10 years ago. I was flying to Dallas and I ordered from Papa John's and it came 50 minutes and the cheese was hard. You know, it's like, you know, you know? And so I got online and I, I put in my receipt number in the store that I was at, and I said, I'm a Papa John's, you know, loyal um, buyer, and that's just disappointed me. The next day, I got a call from the store manager, no lie, and he said, sir, what can we do to get your business back? He said, I'm sorry, it was a Sunday night. We had half of our staff. I said, $20 gift card would be nice. That gift card was there before I ever got home. Okay. So, am I a Papa John's fan? Yes. Make sure you complain, but be, be constructive. Okay. You know, we're all humans. We all have failures, but we all want to try for success. Okay. Perishability. Services can't be inventoried, they cannot be stored. There is no such thing as service capacity. It means that you have to be prepared. It is place and time sensitive. The balance of supply and demand is nearly impossible. And the idling of equipment and services when demand is low can many times put you out of business. So one of the things I talked about with Hickory, um, mostly to myself, is that if you really want to use Hickory well, I think we should have Saturday classes because the people in Hickory are hardworking individuals who may not necessarily be able to come during the week, but especially professional education, I'm director of that, I think that might be feasible. Plus, it means that facilities that in order to maximize need to be used 24 hours a day, seven days a week would be used on an extra day. But I'm talking to myself. Right there. Heterogeneity. Heterogeneity means uniqueness. Heterogeneity means that it varies across the individuals. 
it varies across the individuals who you work with. Does anybody know what the phrase Six Sigma means? Could you explain it? Oh, gosh. Uh, what did you ask? Mathematical term like um, it's the standard deviation. Yes. In, yeah. Right. In the norm. Six sigmas mean three standard deviations plus or minus the perfect center. All right. Six sigma means that you will have less than four per million that are failures. And that's the goal of supply chain and six sigma supply chain. It means that every item that you produce will be the exact same item and that you will only have four in a million that will fail. In the services, that's impossible, all right? You cannot create and standardize a service. And that's not a weakness, that's a strength if you use it right. So I have a friend of mine, Tommy Light, who cuts my hair. I need to go. Uh, and that individual cuts hundreds of people's hair in this town. And every one of those individuals is unique. And every one of those individuals lines up every six weeks to get their hair cut, except for me. All right. They can dramatically increase your overall cost, but it can dramatically increase your profits. So what's the difference between a $200 attorney and a $4,000 an hour attorney? About $3,600. And then finally, what you hope to be able to do is you hope to be able to create relationships because generating repeat business is the lifeblood of any organization. This is why the steel authorized dealerships spend so much money having support staff and service staff there because the people who come in and service the equipment once a year rely on those steel tools. And it isn't the tools, it's as important as the service and the value that they bring. And so, as I've said before, as products themselves become more commodities, services become more important than ever. It's like the very same thing I talk about when I talk about chat GPT. The more we go in this direction, the human interactions are going to become more and more important. Um, our sales concentration and marketing, um, we have 12 students, generally 18 students a year. Every one of those students usually has a job. Has a job. We have not had one student in the last eight years that hasn't graduated who already doesn't have a job because the interpersonal skills mean that much more and it always will. So as they become further away, they become more important. So how do we go about developing new world products? So there are ways to think of products to understand their impact. I've been alive long enough that I've seen probably four in my lifetime. The first is microwave ovens, the computer, the internet, and then I would think of social media. I think of those four big ones that I've been through in my lifetime, all right? These are all new to the world innovations. They're called disruptive technologies or disruptive innovations. Innovation, by the way, and we're gonna talk about this more later. Innovation is not invention. Innovation is something different. Innovation, is sociological. If you look at Schumpeter, who was from the Austrian School of Economics, he stated that innovation 
changes people. It changes lives. It disrupts. It brings new individuals. It creates new capital equipment. It fundamentally shifts the way our lives are the same. Your lives are so different just from 10 years ago. And all of that comes from the innovations that have come about. Innovation is not invention. And believe me, innovation is the thing that keeps Google awake at night and makes Microsoft kick themselves in the head for not coming out with a tablet eight months before the iPad came out. Did you know that, by the way? Microsoft had a tablet, a foldable tablet, that they were ready to go with eight months before Ivy, um, Apple launched the iPad. And they decided not to because they were afraid that it would interrupt with their sales of Microsoft operating system. And so Microsoft operating system in 2008 had 92% of all the operating systems on computer technical systems. Anybody want to guess Microsoft's percentage now? On total machines? Less than a third. Yeah. Because now what they did was they fundamentally changed the platforms. We went from desktop environments, laptop environments, to mobile environments, and the environments themselves fundamentally changed the way we play the game. I'll bring in and talk about that. So we first talk about new world products that are disruptive in nature. They're radical. They're innovative. Um, I will even put Tesla in there and their models, even though we've had electric vehicles for over 100 years. Then we start talking about new product lines. New product lines are not as risky as uh, true innovations, but they're basically diver diversities. So. Tell me all the things we can do with this. Flashlight. Flashlight. Yep. What's that? Oh. Oh, yeah. Phone. What else? Pardon? Cell. Cell. What else? Okay. Text. Web. Bank. Bank. What's that? Camera. What else? Set an alarm. Set alarms. There you go. Navigate. Navigate. Voice, Voice, yeah. Voice command. What else? Social media. Social media. Yeah. Rock your brain. Pardon me. Rock your brain. Rock your brain. <laughs> Research. Research. Yep. Yeah. So I'm not going to go on any further than that, but just to give you an idea, this is a product line in which it basically had existing technology that basically that was brought together with a single physical unit. And when I talked about on uh, Tuesday, when I asked everybody, because I had a, um, a Razor phone at that point, who had a mobile phone and everybody did, that's when I had one of those bang on the head moments and realized I had missed something. And this is an example it's not as risky as true innovation. And you have all of these diversion, you know, technologies that move into it. Um, but if you think about it, the spread of the things that this does now is almost implacable to, to try to figure out. So product line extensions are basically new styles and features of an existing equipment. And this is where we get into the concepts of the iPad mini, uh, the iPad Pro, um, literally you're getting from there all the way up to the MacBooks, just different unique features and styles, different permutations in the way that we do things. And these certainly find their own ways in which they can find their ways out to, out to the future. You can improve an existing product. As a matter of fact, that is one of the things, continuous innovation that Samsung probably does better than anyone else does. Samsung is not necessarily a great radical innovator, but what they do do is they come up with taking these particular items 
and broaden their abilities. So this is a Galaxy 22. Um, my wife has uh, iPhones. And when she wants to take long pictures, she uses mine because I have a 100x zoom lens on this. So, you know, I'm the one who takes all the long term, long stuff pictures. OK. And my brother in law was really upset at me. He said, I hate you. Um, and they had to go out and buy the newest iPhone with that. So anyway, product line extensions or new new products. The last is what's called reposition. All right. So repositioning is when you take an existing product. You either create it or you reposition its ideal of where it was and ultimately open it up to new markets. So one of the great, one of the great products to come out of the 19th century was Cadillac, um, part of Leland products. And Cadillac for, for three generations was known as a symbol of engineering success in the United States. It was unparalleled. However, Cadillac got a little old. And so let me see if I can do this. So get out of my way. Let's see if I can go on YouTube and not scream our ears off. Let's see. So I'm going to try my very best to not make this too loud, but I'm going to try to get through it. Typically, kind of this isn't my best game, but this I do know something about. Getting around the country in comfort and style, for me, that has to be a Cadillac. You know, I really like what they've done to this Eldorado for 1974. The new instrument panel, for one thing. I like the way it looks and the way it organizes things. But for me, the real pleasure in this car is in the driving. The engine advancements give you finer performance. From start to stop. I like the traction and stability of front wheel drive. I don't know how they do it year after year, but for me, Cadillac is America's number one luxury car. If you agree with me that second best isn't good enough, why not go see your authorized Cadillac dealer? Life is too short to put it off for long. All right. White bread, um, just country club style. Um, Cadillac had been known actually in GMC as like the four stages that you would go through for vehicles. You would start with a Chevy, you'd move to a Pontiac, go to a GM, I mean a, um, a Buick, and then if you made it all the way, you'd go to a Cadillac. Well, the problem with that is, is that Cadillac started losing its engineering status, all right? It just became status in and of itself and hollow inside. All right, in very many ways. What really hurt Cadillac during the 80s is when GM moved to the unibody constructions and basically took the same body that a Chevrolet Caprice was and used it for the Cadillac Cimarron and destroyed the image. So Cadillac realized it had to retool. It had to find some way of redefining itself. And what they did was they went back to the drawing board they went back to the engineering, and this is where they ultimately came. Let's see. All right, let's see. I think this is it. Okay, this is the one that. So this was played during the Super Bowl 2003, and this is where. Cadillac redefined itself and repositioned itself. And folks, the symbolism in here, I want you to soak all of this up because this is what marketing does. This is what you're hoping to do.
ಹೇಳಿ So, in essence, this is what a repositioning does. It repositions in our mind a unique place. It returns them to their roots of engineering. And the Cadillac CTS was one of the highest selling models for almost a decade right now. They were led, led ultimately into their SUVs and all of the others. It was a brilliant success in a way that we would reposition. Remember, positioning is a unique place in the consumer's mind. They took them out of that white bread country club world and put them on the cutting edge of engineering. Worked great. Saw them in 73, Led Zeppelin. Mm -hmm. I was 16. Mobile. My mom didn't know. I'm sorry, mom. Okay. So these are them. And then the last one, of course, is cost reductions, where you can modify the product in a way so that it's similar to competing products and do it at a lower price. It's the last step, unfortunately, and you ultimately don't want to get to that place, but sometimes you do, sadly enough. So where do we come up with new ideas? Well, it depends on our particular corporations and the way that we do those things But when we generate ideas, one of the things is that we should never, ever turn any good idea away, all right? One of the things that when we talk about when you're in the, um, when you're trying to come up with new ideas is that there's no bad idea, all right? You can get them from your customers. You can get them from employees. Of course, you can do basic primary and secondary research, which is extremely important. Anywhere a good idea comes along. The interesting thing, as I said before, is that buy online, pick up in store became one of those things that we started talking about a decade ago, but it wasn't right for our particular markets until now, until the situation occurred where it was in its best place to be able to, to not only survive, but succeed. Then the screening point is when you start matching those particular ideas with a firm's abilities, all right? It's not an idea processing point. You don't try to see whether you as a corporation can do those things, but it is now the time where you try to evaluate which jobs can be done by your corporation and do they achieve the greatest success? So, This moves on to the development. This is when you actually start making the product. You actually have them online. You actually run them. And then you're starting to make physical items. Test marketing is those both real and it is simulated. Test marketing means that you go to particular areas and you debut those products and evaluate their particular acceptance. And you try to be careful where you do it because you never know what's going to go on. True story. Um, Dr. Babin, who was my, um, the chair of, of um, my uh, committee, Uh, dissertation committee worked with uh, Zaps potato chips. I don't know if you've heard of them. Zaps potato chips is out of Louisiana. They're kettle chips. They're made differently than others. In other words, they're made in a giant kettle. They're very crunchy. They come in standard flavors with super hot ones at the same time. Um, so anyway, they came out, I'd say like 15, 20 years ago, And they wanted to do a test market in Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge is the largest city in Louisiana. Um, they went to a grocery um, uh, outlet called Albertsons and they stacked them in there and they wanted to see how they were going to do in two weeks. So they came back in two weeks, they were all gone. And they went, wow, this is amazing. So they stacked them and they decided to come back in a week, they were all gone. 
So they put more on the shelves. They came back in two days. They were all gone. Turns out the Lays people were coming and buying everything that they had so that they could evaluate them as competition and to keep their particular evaluation of how well they did. That's a true story, okay? So those kind of things happen. You know, espionage happens. And SAPS is now successful everywhere. You can go in the Walmarts now and you can go into Lowe's and you can pick them up anywhere. So anyway, that's what test marketing does. And then finally, you can launch the product and you have a marketing plan and you try to stimulate awareness and ultimately you, you try to define success if you can, all right? And so this is the great way that it's done. Idea generation can come in many forms. They can also be called venture, uh, uh, venture systems where you have two different organizations come together and bring individuals from each organization who don't necessarily know anything about each other. So like one of the great venture organizations came about when Toyota and GM in the late 80s created a factory in California and they developed a, a, a car, a subcompact that was bolt to bolt exactly the same. It was the Toyota Celica when it was sold under Toyota and it was the Chevy Nova when it was sold by GM. And the Toyota outsold the Nova five to one, same machine. All right. By the way, that factory now, um, Tesla owns it and they're producing Model 3s out of that. So new product development process. All right. Pricing. So. What is the price? Why is price so important? Well, four reasons. Because the revenue equation says that in order to achieve revenue, it is price times quantity sold. Okay? You have two ways in which you can generate profits. You can either increase the price or sell more of it. And of those, number two, price is the easiest to change. And price can have dramatic or insignificant changes on quantity sold. And so you have to be careful about price. Third is, you go through enormous amounts of work to find out how your competitors are priced. And the last thing about price is price is one of the really few ways that you can demonstrably differentiate between products. If I were to go and look for a black t-shirt and the black t-shirt was from H&M, how much would you think that would cost? I looked at the prices before I came in. How much would a black t-shirt from H&M cost? About 13 bucks. Okay, so that's a good, pro that's good. Um, yes. How much would a black t-shirt cost from Walmart? Right on the button. How much would it cost if it had Tommy Hilfiger on? $275. Yes. Yes. All because those brands has a different name. Each one of those things has a different price. Isn't that amazing? All right. And yet they will get the $275 for that black t-shirt 
just as easily as H&M will get those $13. Price has so much to do with the consumer's perception. That is the reason why you have to be so extremely careful when it comes to working with price. And so we have to understand that when we're coming up with price, that there are many more decisions that have to go in with than simply just doubling the cost and coming up with an overall price. What is the purpose of the price? The first is you can be profit oriented. Apple in their strategy is very profit oriented. What is the profit as a percentage on this laptop? Like how much? Yeah, as a percentage. I would say at least like six. Six percent. Six percent. So if this was a thousand dollars, Hewlett Packard would get sixty bucks. What is the profit margin on this app? Higher. Forty percent. Okay. How? Okay. Because Apple can charge it and they can get it. All right. Profit oriented. That's the way they are. Okay. Volume pricing. Volume pricing is oriented towards drive turnover, greater number of units sale, sold, having a mass sales volume. Texas Instruments, since 1973, has been selling calculators. Texas Instruments is still selling calculators. Why? Because they are volume oriented and price their units as low as they possibly can before they ever come out with another item. Their idea is to dominate the market by seizing all of the assets. In other words, they want as much of the percentage of the market as they can. Hewlett Packard, in terms of engineering calculators, own the world until Texas Instrument came along and effectively took that part away. Now, Texas Instruments doesn't necessarily worry about the four button calculators that you know cost next to nothing. That's not their market, but they are there for the scientific calculators and the rest. Market demand basically is also survival. They'll charge whatever the market is there. And usually what this also means is you're hopeful that you're going to be able to maintain a sustained amount over a given amount of time. Market share tends to be one of those things where in the mature cycle or the product, in the product life cycle, when, you're, when the market has basically reached maturity, this is when you start to see market share become more important. Why? Well, in the great um, in the great fight for revenue, all right, when the total dollars that in an industry peaks and you can't go any further, unfortunately, you still have to report to your board, and they're going to want to know why you didn't grow by eight percent this year. If the industry is not growing anymore, then the only way that you can be able to grab more money is to grab more market share. And so market share is usually when the market is matured and you're just looking for a way to expand by eating into someone else's, all right? Cash flow is usually at the very beginning of a product life cycle at, at the initial point where you're trying to recover as cash as fast as you possibly can, especially if when you sunk an enormous amount into research and development. Competitive matching usually happens with stores, not necessarily with industries, 
Um, suggested retail price basically usually means exactly what it sounds like. So stores, in order to be able to compete with other stores in a given geographic area, just match, okay? Prestige pricing, um, you can look at this as something like BMW. Uh, BMW is deliberately priced something like 15 to 20% over its accepted market value, quite simply because the item itself is trying to hit a certain level of prestige or respect. And if you were to not hit that price, you would be very concerned. If I were walking down the street in New York and somebody offered me a $20 Rolex, what would my thought be? Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. Rolexes are so respected, no lie. Um, Dr. Babin, once again, um, the chair of my department has a friend who collects counterfeit Rolexes. There is such a market, okay? Counterfeit Rolexes, if they match Rolexes, have more value than you can believe, okay? Such a thing exists in this world, all right? So it's not a collection of Rolexes, it's a collection of fake, and the fake Rolexes have prestige too. Figure it out, okay? The last is that quite simply, you're just trying to maintain current prices to be able to be on a survival mode. And I think if you look at where most laptops are right now, laptops and, and, and PCs, now, I love the fact that desktop units have found a second generation, especially in gaming units. I bought one myself and it's awesome, all right? They reinvented itself. I've got an NVIDIA 3060 inside my machine. Um, it's, it's awesome. I needed a big one to do that. But laptops have hit this level. And other than if your name is Apple, you're, you're living at a 6% margin and you're just happy to be sliding along at that level. Oh, I've run out of voice. Let's go ahead and finish today. Remember to read Marketing Myopia, and I will see you tomorrow at 11.30. Have a good day. <laughs>